Today's passage comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of Yahweh blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, Yahweh Elohim comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's easy for us to portray the gospel and will of God in terms of heavy burdens to bear. We hear voices clamoring that Yahweh's will is condemnation. And we quickly find passages in the Hebrew scriptures that speak of condemnation and chastisement and punishment. We hear in our traditions the words of people like Jonathan Edwards speaking of sinners in the hands of an angry God. And yet, what do we do with passages like this one in Isaiah chapter 40, which speak not of, of punishment, but of comfort, not of condemnation, but with punishment having taken its full course, and God instituting restoration, rest, and grace and mercy for the people. We find something very harshly different in these words from what so many would ask us to expect of God. And we are called to wonder if perhaps this angry God that Edward spoke of might not be much more our projection of ourselves and our attitudes upon God rather than God coming to us as God truly is. Isaiah's words here are perhaps in the most famous passage of the whole book of Isaiah thanks to Handel's Messiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people. These words strike a discordant note as well with the rest of Isaiah that has come up to this point. For in chapters 1 through 39, we find Isaiah describing the doom that would settle upon Judah. We find descriptions of how 
Judah had failed in living up to Yahweh's demands upon them. We find descriptions of other nations around that had also failed to live up to Yahweh's standards. And we find one nation after another. It's neared in a time in which Babylon would march and capture nation after nation and force them to bow. We find words of gloom, of doom, of impending exile and punishment. And we hardly expect to find, turning to chapter 40, that we would hear words of comfort, of glad tidings, of announcing peace and prosperity and the restoration of Judah to some unknown glory of times never before seen. And yet this picture of turning everything known upside down is precisely what we are led to here in chapter 40 of Isaiah. This is hardly a reversal to times past. Rather, this is Judah being introduced into a new understanding of what it would mean to live in the presence of God Almighty, of Yahweh, by whom they had claimed to be a prized possession among all the nations of the world. Yes, Isaiah's words up to this point had foretold coming punishment, chastisement, because of Judah's unjust practices, Judah's failure to live up to the requirements of being the people of Yahweh. But there's more to the story than simply that. As these words speak comfort to Judah and speak of a return and speak hope of God marching visibly into the midst of the nation and restoring things to some new ideal and new prosperity never before seen. We find that the nation of Israel had first to be brought to its knees to recognize its abject failure so that they might return with new expectations of what life under Yahweh's reign would look like. Those who would march off into exile were not all of the nations. Babylon was not interested in carting everyone off and bringing new people in to populate the land. That would have been much too burdensome and onerous for Babylon. Rather, they were interested much more in taking out those Daniel describes as being the wealthy, the powerful, the elite, those who were the movers and shakers in society along with their children, removing those who were looked to for leadership, who were seen as the prominent members of society, Babylon could then bring in a new class of leadership who would not find a people willing to bow to their call to summon a rebellion against the empire. And so the wealthy, the powerful, the established, the landholders, those with pull among the people were the ones carted off into exile. Those remaining behind would find little change when some new class of overlords were brought in to oppress them in their stead. 
For Judah had failed to live up to Yahweh's demands. And if we scour through Isaiah's words leading up to this point, we find that one of the essential ingredients of this oppression was economic. It was failing to employ Yahweh's economic demands for the nation in which they would care for those who were vulnerable and poor. Care for those who found themselves with no one to speak on their behalf. Care for those who were powerless and neglected and stepped upon and passed aside. No, the elites would be removed from Judah. And after that generation had passed away, Yahweh would then restore Judah, not to what it had been, but to something wholly new. This was the hope of which Isaiah spoke. This was the message of restoration that Isaiah could claim. This was the new establishment of God's presence, of Yahweh living visibly among the people, in which all would see readily Yahweh's redemption in which all would reap the bounty of Yahweh's fields, in which all would find a new restoration and a new existence of loving one's neighbor as oneself, no holds barred, a nation devoid of discrimination, devoid of powerful elites who held themselves aloof from the misery of those upon whose backs they earned their wealth. Now this was a call to a new existence, something Judah and Israel had never seen because they had failed to measure up to Yahweh's demands and requirements. Yahweh still had that initial vision for Judah to carry out, but in order for them to live up to those demands and Yahweh's requirements, they needed a full reset. They needed much more than polishing off a few details here and there and yonder like we would polish a few defects in a piece of wood freshly cut. Yahweh said, no, we need a restart. We need a complete do-over. So once you have had your time in exile, I will bring you back, but not to the reality as you have left it but to something completely new. In exile, you will learn what it means to serve an oppressive force as you have oppressed those under your feet here. And so as you return from exile, somewhere down the road, you will return with a new appreciation of what it means to live under the hand of Yahweh and be a people chosen by Yahweh as a prized possession. To bear witness to the presence of Yahweh among mortals. It is hard for us in the midst of turmoil facing down the destruction of life as we have known it, to see past the current crisis 
And yet these are Yahweh's words through Isaiah. Comfort my people. Announce glad tidings to Jerusalem because Yahweh will come to usher in not the reality you have always known. Not the comfort of nostalgia for some time past that you yearn to recreate. But God's new creation among you of what always should have been, but never was. You see, as we face uncertain times, as life is shaken up around us and we find ourselves unsettled, it is in those moments that God can most easily mold us and fashion us into the people we should have been all along. Hopefully we don't need quite as complete a restart as ancient Judah. Hopefully our lives have been lived closer to the realities of Yahweh's will for us in Christ Jesus. Yet still, as Paul reminds us, we must press on to a new realization of the will of God in our lives. Where every valley is lifted up, where every hill is made low, where all people have equal access to the uncompromising good news of grace and mercy, compassion, love, and acceptance in the very presence of God living and moving and working among us. We will not come out of our current pandemic as we were. We will not simply go back to life as we knew it. And we should not expect to. Rather, we must look forward to Yahweh's words of comfort in calling us into a new realm of existence in which we might more fully embody the will, design, and purpose of God for our lives in Christ Jesus. Definitely the poinsettias in our midst will do look differently to us in the year ahead. Definitely, when we gather again to celebrate and sing the songs of faith, the songs of Advent and Christmas, it will ring a different note in our hearts. And yet, as we march forward through this unknown that still awaits us in the weeks and months that lie ahead, we can be confident with Isaiah that comfort is on the way. We can find strength amid the turmoil, the uncertainty, the grief, the loss, the isolation, and being cut off from the ways that we have normally done things. And if we pay attention to Yahweh's claim upon our lives, to the presence of Christ moving among us, we can find a revitalized way to affirm the faith to which we have clung these many years. Christ is with us. 
Christ lives among us. Christ and the reign of Christ is a present reality in our midst and is yet coming in some fuller manifestation that we have yet to embrace. That is Isaiah's message of comfort. There is something more that yet awaits us. Something different than we have as yet experienced. Something greater that in the end will be worth all the turmoil, all the upheaval, all the uncertainty, all the anxiety that we may face in the moment as our lives feel uprooted by the change in the air. Comfort, my people. For God is coming into our midst and will gather the sheep in his arms, gently feeding those that are with young, carrying them in his bosom.